Okay, so uh, tonight, um, Shar Brigham is going to be sharing her presentation on the buzz about honeybees with us. Um, Shar is a Master Naturalist volunteer from Oneida County. And um, this is Shar's very first uh, PowerPoint presentation she's ever put together. So I'm very proud of her and grateful that she spent the time to do this for us tonight. So um, Shar, you can take it away. Okay, thank you. I was gonna give a little introduction um, about how I came up with this data. I, um, I got a really good as we go along um, that was easy reading and detailed and uh, fun to read. And I also um, spoke with three people that um, locally have bees. And I also uh, got a lot of books from the library and obviously use the wonderful World Wide Web. <laughs> so uh, I should have probably had this screen up while I was talking, but um, these are some of the things we're gonna cover over the next 45 minutes. Primarily, uh, that was interesting to know that bees as pollinators are also honey producers. So it's just a, was amazing to me how they make honey. So that's why I chose this uh, insect to further um, study. So um, I have a little history about honeybees. They're the only insect that makes human food uh, for food for human consumption, and the world egg depends on them. Uh, without uh, the honeybees, there would be disaster because a third of the world food supply is pollinated by the honeybees. And it was interesting, one of the statistics was um, if you were in a grocery store, if we didn't have the honeybees pollinating, half of the produce would disappear. So if you looked at a produce aisle, picture half of it gone. That's what it would look like if we didn't have honeybees. As far as species of bees, all kinds of bees, there's 20,000 species in the world. Um, but as far as um, honeybees, there's 4,000 species of native honeybees in North America and 23 honeybee space species that are non-native. And um, this presentation is about the honeybees. So they are non-native. They were imported from Europe with the colonists back in the 1600s. So I wanted to know um, about the actual honeybee species. So I was researching um, species of just honeybees that produce honey. And it turns out that the European, and it's also called Western honeybee, is the most popular pollinator and honey producer. But when I researched some of the other honeybees, it came up with these six that are listed, but they didn't list the European slash Western honeybee as part of, of those six. And I wasn't sure about that, but those listed there are all honeybee producers and the most popular ones. There are other breeds of honeybees um, that are not listed here. These are the most popular ones. And um, it's noted that um, bees are actually bred for some of these reasons, like to survive a shorter off season, uh, to adjust their temperament, uh, to make them more um, disease resistance. Um, so they actually breed the bees uh, to change their behaviors or traits. And uh, one of the articles was saying that maybe the way that they're being bred is causing their immunity to be bad and that's why maybe they're dying or, or getting more susceptible to disease. So that's something to consider is how people breed the bees could be causing their demise. So 70% of all bees nest underground, um, but honeybees 
nest where in the wild honeybees nest where there's protection so there's uh, rock crevices hollow trees the underside of roofs um, and then warmer climates there's more of them just hanging from a tree um, which I'm not sure about that. I mean, because they're not protected, but that's a statistic I found. Honeybees are very social insects. Um, out of all the bees, the honeybees are the only ones that are social. They live in a well-organized family group and they all have uh, specific tasks. So um, if they wanted to make a wild honeybee hive, they would strip off the bark say um in a hollow tree and smooth the uh walls with propolis um and then they would uh chew the wax that they actually create from their own body until it becomes soft to make the honeycomb and i'll talk more about propolis um in a few minutes but they start the hive by sealing it with propolis and then they excrete their wax themselves and they chew the wax and then they use it to make the honeycomb. Honeybee hives are used for several years, whereas other bee hives are just used for a shorter period, for like a year. And um, another interesting fact is uh, a hive has one queen and about 50,000 to 80,000 bees. Isn't that quite a lot? Wow. And uh, here's some pictures of, of where they like to build hives in the wild, um, under roofs, um, in the crevice of a tree, and there's uh, one on a tree. I wondered about this, uh, so I found a picture. So. In the hive, they actually build it from the top down. So um, it shows like the honeys at the top, um, then the pollen, and the um, like, it's everything seg segmented, uh, the propolis and um, the brood. That means um, that's the nest with the eggs and the larva and the, you know, the babies and the eggs. That's what the brood is. It's um, it's the developing uh, bees, and then the queen cell is uh, down. The queen cells are down at the bottom. Um, a swarm. Uh, I was mentioning how there's wild uh, beehives. If you see uh, one picture, it could be a swarm, um, and that happens usually in the spring, but it can happen year round. Uh, I'm sorry, in the in the summer, in the fall, but a swarm usually happens in the spring, and it's when the colony is overcrowded, so it splits um, into two or more hives. So it'll go to a tree nearby and start another hive, like you saw in that picture, um, and the hive in a swarm consists of the original queen and several thousand workers. Um, we'll talk a more, little bit more about swarms. So here's uh, the body parts of the BZ bodies. The uh, head has an antenna or two antennas and they use the antennas to smell, feel, touch, taste, and even hear. Um, also on their head is in their mouth area is the pro, proboscis. Um, it's a couple of long tubes and they use that to suck up water and uh, nectar and honey inside of the hive. Um, they also have mandibles in, in part of their mouth and they use the mandibles to chew. The stinger is on the end of their abdomen and uh, drone bees have no stinger. We'll talk more about that going down. Um, they have five eyes and their body, as we all know, oops, is um, yellow and black uh, with a hard shell and sticky hair to hold the 
the pollen. This was really interesting to me. Their stomach does so much, or their abdomen. They have two stomachs, and um, one stomach holds the nectar that they get from the flowers, and the other stomach is for regular digestion because they eat um, sugar, uh, which is the nectar, they, and they also eat pollen. I mean, they eat the things they collect. So they have two stomachs and they're separated. Um, so what they do is when they get the nectar from the flower, they put it in, the, in this other part of their stomach, and then they regurgitate the nectar into the honeycomb cells. Um, let's see. So the workers, uh, the worker bees have glands on their stomach that make, that secretes wax. Uh, and then the wax, um, you know, hardens and that's what they scrape off and use uh, to chew and make the honeycomb. So again, they have glands on, the, the worker bees have glands on their stomach that uh, creates the wax, which is amazing. And the queen's uh, reproductive system is in her stomach. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the stinger is uh, located on the end of the stomach or the abdomen, but the drones do not have a stinger. Uh, they have six legs and the hind legs have combs on them that they use to clean their antennas and to brush the pollen uh, from their hair. And they take that pollen and they, they brush it into uh, like a pollen sack. And that's what we see is a big round yellow or orangey uh, ball on their hind legs. So uh, their legs uh, keep busy keeping things clean and moving the pollen down uh, down their legs into a basket. And they have two pairs of wings and uh, they can travel up to 22 miles an hour and they travel up to five miles for the nectar. And that's what's making the buzzing sound is their wings flapping at 200 uh, times a second. Pollen, so on these next uh, few slides, besides honey, the honeybees make some other ingredients that are sold to humans. Uh, pollen is actually sold to us as a, um, a diet supplement. Um, so pollen, again, is the dry yellow powder that's found on the male organ on the flower, which is called the anther. Um, the pollen is used for um, Let's see, let me think a minute. It's used for pollination, which we'll get to, but the, uh, the bees eat pollen as a protein source and they feed the pollen to their, their babies or their larvae. So it's met, uh, marketed as an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory. And something that's interesting is um, pesticides affect plants and, um, like if you spray with a pesticide, it gets inside the cells of the plant. So then, you know, it excretes out to the pollen. So sometimes the pollen isn't good in the whole process because of pesticides. It can make the bees sick or it can make these pills, these pollen pills not be that great because of, of uh, the pesticides. Another thing they make is beeswax. Um, like I mentioned earlier, their stomach um, excretes a wax. Uh, they have some glands in their stomach that is, excretes wax, and the wax goes to the outside of their stomach somehow. Um, and I mentioned that. And they, they take the wax and they chew it and they add some pollen and their saliva is in there and that's what um, makes the propolis. Um, oops, I'm sorry, that's the next one. They, uh, they take the wax and the pollen and the propolis to, they use those items to, to make the wax. 
um, which makes the honeycomb. Uh, you can use beeswax to make candles and the uh, society uses it in lip balm, cosmetics and skin and hair products. Uh, then we come to the propolis. Um, that's called bee glue. So they make the propolis with their saliva, the beeswax, and a plant resin. Um, so when they're out flying around, they're so busy, aren't they? Busy. They're so busy. When they're out flying around, besides getting water and um, nectar and, you know, picking up some pollen on the way, they stop at, um, you know, when they're near a tree bud or tree sap, they get some of the resin from that. That's a good point on that. I don't, I don't know where that resin goes. I forgot to think about that issue, but um, somewhere that resin is in the. Um, so they combine the resin and the wax and the saliva to make the glue. Um, Again, in that propolis, which you can extract from the cell in their honeycomb, is uh, used by humans as an anti-inflammatory or an anti-oxidant. Um, also, propolis is in car wax, chewing gum, and it's used for musical instrument varnish. Royal jelly is another thing that um, the honeybees um, make themselves and that we use as jelly is secreted from the worker bees head glands so it's not from their stomach it's from their head um, and they feed that to all the larva and the adult queen the adult queen eats that her whole life and the larva only eats that for like three days um, Okay, I actually mentioned that. The thing about all these things that I just mentioned, like the pollen and the propolis and the royal gel jelly, is there's really no evidence that, you know, scientific evidence that supports the benefits. It's basically because these things are from nature, you know, herbalists market it as something very healthy for you when people try them and they help with different issues, but the FDA, you know, doesn't, doesn't back that up. So the honeybees are pollinators and uh, pollination is transferring pollen from the male anther to the female stigma. So when the uh, honeybees go on the plant, they get the pollen on their on their legs or on their body and then when they go to the next flower um, they uh, rub off some of it onto the um, female uh, part of the plant and that's how they, the plant reproduces so it'll make a seed and then eventually a, you know a fruit will grow so honeybees and um, other pollinators are all declining and we'll talk more about why that is. And honeybees are our most common pollinator of our crops out of all the other bats and uh, ants and uh, mammals. Okay, let's see. Um, so nectar is a sweet liquid, which is mostly sugar or glucose, and it's produced by flower glands and it's a source of energy for the pollinators of, of all kinds, including the honeybees. Um, pollen is a fine yellow dry powder that's made by the male organ on the anther, which is the top of, it's at the top of the flower. Again, uh, pollen is a source of protein for bees and for the larva. And again, pollen is used uh, by humans uh, as a nutritional uh, medicinal value, but it's not validated, like I mentioned, by the FDA. Now we're going to talk about the roles. Um, so here's a picture of the queen, which is the biggest one and has the dot. That's how, uh, that's how beekeepers or ap apiarist, I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, but 
that's how they know it's the queen because it's marked with a dot or the shape of her uh, abdomen is longer and, and fatter. So there's one queen in a hive and she's usually the largest. Um, and her job is to reproduce, that's her only job. And the queen lives the longest, uh, three to five years. And they're rarely seen outside of the hive. So they're not out flying around. They mate with the drones and um, they lay 1,500 eggs per day or 250,000 per year. So she's very busy and the, the, the drones are busy. Uh, so they're both busy mating and the, she lays quite a few eggs. And it's amazing that she controls the sex of the eggs. And I didn't research how that is done, but that's quite amazing. She controls the sex of the eggs. Um, another tidbit is the sex of the eggs is based on the needs of the colony. Um, let's see. She produces a pheromone that um, tells the worker bees what to do. And uh, she has a stinger, but it's straight. And she only uses it on other queens. Um, the worker bee's stinger is uh, jagged and barred, but the queen's uh, stinger is straight and she only uses it on other queens. And um, all the other bees in the colony select the queen and they protect her. The drones is uh, a male and there's hundreds to thousands of drones uh, in a hive. And they only live a short two to four, two weeks to four months. Um, let's see, and their only job is to mate with the queen and they die after mating and they don't have any stingers like I mentioned. And they're kicked out of, they're kicked out of the hive by the worker bees at the start of winter. So here's the real love uh, workers. The worker bees are female and there's thousands of bees of these bees in the hive and they're the ones that do everything. Um, they live four to six weeks, um, which isn't very long. And then uh, if they're over, depending on their age, if they're, if it's getting to be winter time, then they'll be in the hive, you know, through winter. So that's why they can live up to six months if they're stuck in the hive during the winter. Um, so I mentioned their stinger is barbed. What's neat is when they sting somebody, then they die. So if a human gets stung by the worker bee, uh, their, their uh, stinger is stuck in the person and then they die after that. <clears throat> so um, this is a list of their jobs, the rest of these bullets. So they gather the nectar, um, water and pollen and propolis. Um, they feed the queen and the larva. They pack the pollen and nectar into the cells. They fan the cells, they guard the hive. They build and repair the honeycombs. And they, they actually help the queen decide the gender of the eggs. That's definitely an interesting thing I'd like to further research, but they help the queen decide the gender of the eggs. And um, the workers determine if the colony needs a new queen and they tell the queen. So it's like, your time is up queen, you know, we're gonna get a new one. So those, that whole scenario, I'm interested in learning more about how they do that. Lastly, we have the larva. So the, um, the eggs that the queen lays there's the life cycle. So it goes from an egg to the larva, to the pupa, and then the adult. Um, and they're all raised in the honeycomb and they're fed royal jelly. And um, like I mentioned, they only get the royal jelly for three or four days. And then they're fed a mixture of nectar and pollen. Um, so the larva, it takes about 22 days to develop from the egg to the adult. And it's kind of neat that the workers chew themselves out of the cell, but the drones have to be chewed out by the workers. So 
they don't just pop out of the cell on their own, depending on what type of bee they are. And their sexual maturity is reached after nine days. Um, honey production, here's some facts about honey. Honey is nectar that is evaporated. And uh, nectar is mostly water, it's, it's water and sugar but um, it's 80% moisture. So that's quite a bit of water and nectar. And what it is, um, is uh, they fan it and the birds use their wings and they fan the nectar to get the moisture out of it. And they reduce it down to 18%. And then they cap the cell with their wax. Isn't it amazing? I mean, they just know how much to fan their wings till that moisture gets down to 18% and then they cap it. Um, so they use the nectar during the winter for, uh, as an energy source, because it's sugar. And um, one bee visits over 2 million flowers, uh, or 556 workers gather to make one pound of honey. And uh, one hive produces anywhere from 10 to 200 pounds of honey a year. It's a big range. Um, I kind of wondered why some of the sites gave such a big range, but it all depends on how many, how many, um, uh, well, it depends on, I guess, the weather and just the season and, you know, as far as how much pounds you're going to get. Um, I thought it was neat that bees uh, do like to go in the pool and get a drink. If it's really hot out like it was today, um, they'll, they will go in a pool and drink. And um, let's see what else. So again, they get the, their water through the nectar, but if it's uh, really hot out, they'll take a dip. Uh, another really neat thing about bees and how they know where to go you know, how do they know where to find uh, the flowers or how do they know where to go find um, a new hive, you know, when they swarm? They, they do a dance. So there's actually two dances, a round dance, and uh, which I didn't put a slide on about, and a waggle dance. Um, so I'm not gonna read the slide, but um, they, they do these dances to determine what direction to go or um, to find um, good sources of flowers and they communicate that with each other. Um, let's see, what else does it say here? Alert others to food. Right, so like I mentioned, um, that's how they communicate. It says that um, they travel, uh, let's see, is performed by bees origin. So they'll travel 150 meters away from the hive to find the food. So I thought, well, just so you know, 150 meters is three football fields. So that's, they'll tell another bee how far away that food is, and it could be three football fields away. Let's see. So I mentioned the apiary Apiarius, I wasn't sure how to quite say it, but an apiary is a collection of beehives and a beekeeper, that's the other um, name for a beekeeper is apiarius. Uh, you should check to see if it's legal where you live. Um, I wanted to look into that a little more, but if it's legal to have the hives, I guess there's you know criteria on that, check with your town. Um, Honey is harvested in the spring or the fall, but ideally when 80% of the frame, let's see, in order to be sold in New York State, it has to be 100% honey, nothing mixed in. And when you go to the store and buy honey, I didn't realize that, but it's uh, actually been heated and pasteurized to avoid crystallization. Because if you take pure honey and leave it in the cupboard, um, it'll start to get thick and crystallize, and that's normal. Um, but store commercial businesses heat it and pasteurize it so that doesn't happen. And some some businesses add sugar and other things to the honey 
So if you want the best um, nutritious honey, uh, you should get it from a, a beekeeper. Um, they all filter their honey to certain degrees. Uh, if you wanted uh, raw honey, there's nothing filtered. So you would have pieces of wax in there, pollen, body parts, um, and you know, but all the enzymes are there. So that's the maximum health benefits is raw honey. And honey never expires. The top producers of honey are North Dakota, and um, worldwide is China. And um, let's see, when we colony losses. Okay. Um, I didn't, I was going to talk about diseases, but somehow I got this on the slide. But um, there's been a lot of colony losses. So uh, production of um, honey's gone down. So it says that. Um, Let's see, colony losses have gone from 26% in 2006 to 44% in 2017. So there's been a big decline in uh, honeybee colonies. Um, let's see, bee food. Okay. Uh, what do bees eat um, in their hives? They're fed purified water and um, sugar syrup and also uh, pollen substitutes. We'll talk more about that. Um, it was neat to know that bees do not fly if it's below 50 degrees. And inside the hive, it's 95 degrees. Uh, if it gets too warm, they um, fan their wings and use the, the water uh, that's in the hive. They fan in the cells they fan their wings to make um, condensation to try to cool down the hive. So they keep it, you know, they don't want it going above 95 degrees. So if you're a beekeeper and you're sitting out near your hive, you're gonna look to see if they have pollen on their legs. And if they do, you can stop early in the season, you can stop feeding them sugar. You can actually take it out of the hive. Because I guess if you leave the sugar, if you, um, if you leave their food in their hive and they don't need it, there is something about that. Um, like it might get rancid or something. So they say to take out the, the sugar water. Um, if you see they have pollen on their legs, um, don't leave it in there. Uh, let's see. So now I was gonna talk about the, th the seasons. In the spring, if you're a brand new bee uh, keeper, that's when you would install all uh, your hives. And they say to have two hives because say you spend a thousand dollars on, um, well, no, no. Say you spent, you know, $500 on your um, bee equipment to extract the honey and all the, your suit and all that. And you only get one hive. And what if your bees die? then you, you know, it's safer to have two hives. That way if something goes wrong, you got the other hive. Uh, you wanna put your hive where there's no direct wind, where it's sunny and um, where there's a water source. So hopefully like if it's near a pond, you know, if you have a pond nearby, that's a, a good spot to put it. Um, and I, I mentioned the food, so the, the food is one part water to one part sugar, so it's like a sugar syrup. Um, let's see, at 60 degrees you can inspect the hive, and they say to do it once a week, and then eventually you can do it every other week and wean it down to once a month. Um, and when you inspect the hive, what you're doing is, you know, you're looking for the queen, you're looking to see if, if the eggs are being laid and if you see any disease like mites and and you always use the smoker um, when you inspect the hive because that um, calms the bees because it causes them to gorge on the honey and then they're full and then they're calm because they're, they're so full from eating so much honey. Isn't that amazing even that right there? I mean, smoke makes them eat more honey. It's just amazing all the things about these bees. Um, 
you might not get a harvest the first season, but some people do. Um, you know, your very first season, you might not, but maybe you will. And that's the time, like I mentioned before, when swarms are popular, uh, build another hive because they're, they're overpopulated inside the current hive. And you can um, hire people to come and take the swarm out of your backyard and give it to, they'll probably give it to someone that has an empty uh, beehive. So, you know, say my neighbor has a beehive and it's empty. So if I found a swarm, I could hire someone to take my swarm and give it to her so she'd get some bees for free. How am I doing on time? All right, I don't have a lot of time left, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, in the summer, like I mentioned, remove the food if not using it. They're less, the bees are less active when it's hot. Make sure they have water. If you're not near a pond, make sure you have good clean water in their uh, hives or nearby because you can put like, um, you can put like a bird feeder with a rock in it uh, in your yard. And like I mentioned, they use the, they cool the hive with their wings. Um, let's see. All right, and you can harvest your honey in the summer, but the peak time is in the fall. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, the thing about winter is to make sure that you leave enough uh, honey for them to eat throughout the winter. I, I asked people how they know how much, how do they know that they're leaving enough honey for the bees to eat through the winter? I guess one man said by how heavy the um the hive is like when you pick it up i mean maybe he measures it or he knows by by luck because he's done it for 13 years but how how much honey to leave because if you don't leave enough you could lose your whole colony and in the fall you want to look good for disease because you want to treat it because you don't want them to die over the winter and inspect on warm days in the winter, um, which you don't want to do that too much because it's cold out, but um, there's more details on that. Um, okay, now we're going to talk about the extraction equipment. So um, you have your bees that you could buy. Um, there's a nook, uh, a pack, or the swarm, like I mentioned. Um, the nook, uh, there's not as, it's a smaller amount of bees and a pack is more bees. I, I kind of need a little more research on that, but I guess the pack would be if you have more than one hive and the nook is, you know, just one hive. But if you get a pack, there's so many bees, you'd have to put them in more than one hive, I'm assuming. There's three kind of hives that you could buy and there's actually four, but I'll show you pictures of that later. So you need your sue and your gloves and your veil and a tool to lift off the top of the hive. Your smoker, like I mentioned, um, you always use your smoker every single time because if you say you hit the hive, you know, or you drop the hive, I mean, you want to have them being not aggressive because it would be a disaster if you did, if they weren't smoked. Um, there's a frame knife and it can be heated to scrap the, uh, scrape the wax off the comb or if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have to buy the heated one. You can, you know, use one that's not heated. Then there's the refractometer that measures moisture. Uh, you have to make sure that the, if there's more than 20% moisture in your, in your uh, honey, it'll cause uh, fermentation and it'll get like rancid. So you have to check your moisture before you pour it. Then there's the extractor and that spins the honey out of the comb and that takes about 10 minutes. Then you have to have a warmer or a double boiler um, to, uh, some people don't use all this fancy equipment and they, they just take the wax and honey and I'll throw it in a pot. So you would have to, you would have to warm that or boil it to to get the wax to melt. So um, uh, again, some people don't use all the fancy equipment, but 
you, you would need a warmer and then a strainer to strain the honey and then your food grade buckets in your jars. So I'll try to speed it up. Here's um, some pictures of your suits, uh, gloves. There's the smoker, look how that's cute. And you, the fuel for the smoker is like wood or newspaper, I, I read, I'm not sure what else. There's uh, an extractor. This is the, the heater, this, this uh, round thing, I think goes either on the extractor to warm it up or, I, or you can put it on some buckets, like I said, if you weren't gonna buy. I'm a little fuzzy on that still. Uh, here's the refractor meter and there's some of your bee uh, feeders. And there's, these are just pictures of the hives. I read and read on the hives. I didn't, I didn't understand it enough and I ran out of time to like explain it to you. But the Lang Langstroth is the most popular one. And here's all the different uh, layers. Uh, the next one, which is similar to the Langstroth is this one here. It's just the shape is different. Um, again, I, I don't know much details you know, on what to say about it, um, you know, but the frames are in here. You're gonna lift up each of those frames to see the, you know, how the eggs are doing and if the queen is there and if you have any disease. And here's uh, another hive, the top bar. Look, at it's very different. Um, this one doesn't have frames. It uses um, wooden bars and then wax strips. So it encouraged them to build the hive. Whereas, you know, the other ones had a frame that they could put the hive on. This one doesn't, it just has these bars and some strips and they have to go create like a foundation themselves. Okay, bee people, there's bee breeders. Um, isn't that neat? I had a little segment of a video, but, um, we had technical difficulties. It was like a two minute video. Look what, how they be, breed the bees. I mean, people in a, in a lab with microscopes and they have to hold these bees and do all this fancy. So then you have a bee supplier that sells the bees and the hives and the equipment. And then you have a bee inspector. So if you're having trouble with your beehive, you can call Nida County Cooperative Extension or whatever county cooperative extension uh, that you live in and they can send somebody out or um, to you know help inspect your hive and they can give you advice on what to do with the diseases that you have and then another bee person is a swarm catcher um, let's see so what I wanted to say is you folks Yes, there's honey, but guess what makes more of money as far as making money is, is renting out your bees. So in, a, in the America, that's uh, what the beekeepers do is they rent it out. That's more, more of a money maker. Um, so there's uh, 115,000 to 125,000 beekeepers in the US. But uh, it says the vast majority are hobbyists with less than 25 hives. So a lot of hobbyists are beekeepers. But as far as making money, it's the, um, the ones that rent their bees out. So commercial beekeepers are those with 300 or more hives. So like I mentioned, the, the commercial beekeepers are bring their hives to a fireman's field for a few days to a few weeks to pollinate the crop. You know what I was wondering is how do the bees know to go back to the tractor trailer or whatever? I don't know how that works. That's something I'd like to research. How do they know, how do they get their bees back or, or do they? Another really neat thing is almonds. 80% of the world's almonds of all of our bees go from all over the US in February to uh, pollinate California's uh, almonds, two thirds, two thirds of United States bee colonies, these commercial people go out. That's a lot, that's 66 whatever percent of US bees go in February to California to uh, pollinate. Um, 
So it says they, the, the commercial beekeepers get about $200 per colony to do that. But then for apples, they only get three, $30 per colony. So it's a big money maker for these bees to travel the country, to go to California to pollinate. They get $200 per colony. Then those same bees will work their way across Florida, Georgia, New York, and Maine to do further pollination. Um, I really am excited about these quotes because I, I, the lady from the Department of Ag emailed me today and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find her name and I got it. So this last year, 46 commercial beekeepers brought over, brought into the New York State over 41,000 colonies. So last year, 46 commercial beekeepers brought 41,000 colonies here. And we used them in New York for apple and cherry pollination. And then uh, 35 permits were issued for queen sales. Um, so I, I was like, oh, so she said, I asked her, so any bees that are produced in New York State need to be inspected and certified free of American fowl blood, which is the disease. So if, if you breed any bees in New York State, you gotta have them inspected and certified before you can sell them. Um, so we're getting towards the end here. So uh, threats um, are the Asian giant hornet. Um, Three were found in Washington state last year. They're two inches long. They, they live in underground hives. They're native to Asia and Japan. And they're known for the horrible thing about them is they kill our honeybee colonies. That's what they like to do. Um, and they have a look alike, which is uh, some, I work for the DEC and someone called um, in the spring saying that she thought that she had one of them, but it was probably the look alike, the European hornet. Um, cause I, the late, this is the latest statistic. None have been found in New York as of when I checked my stats. Some other diseases are the colony collapse disorder. No one, they don't know what the cause is. Just all of a sudden all the worker bees just leave the colony and they're the ones that do all the work. So you can't have a successful hive. Um, so from 2006, when it started happening, to 2013, more than 10 million beehives across the world were just lost because the bees just all of a sudden just left. Uh, another disease is uh, American fowl blood. Like I mentioned, if you wanna sell bees in New York, you have to have them tested for that. It's a bacteria that kills the bee larva. And that is so dangerous because uh, you have to burn your hive afterwards because the spores can stay in there for many years. Um, your, your actual hive that you spent, you know, $300 for, I guess. Um, I don't know if that's just the frames or... Um, then there's the parasitic uh, varosa mite that attaches to the bee and sucks its blood and gives it diseases, uh, viruses. Um, there's like 20 other viruses, believe it or not, still that affect bees and the pesticides are not good, like I mentioned before, because they, the chemicals get absorbed into the plant and then when the, then the pollen and the nectar has bad chemicals in it and then the bees get it and then they might get sick and die and that affects your honey production. So pesticides are not good. Climate change, there's less flowers because of climate change, habitat destruction, uh, land, land destruction, uh, development, I mean. So again, these things are, are causing there to be less flowers, which affects the honeybees, um, livelihood and making honey. So how we can support um, our honeybees is um, the DC is doing more about restoring grasslands and young forests, and they're looking for volunteers all the time. So if you wanted to go to one of their areas with them and cut down tree branches and help restore uh, a young forest, you could do that to make more room for flowers to grow. Um, plant native plants. Um, the bees can only see, I guess they can't see red, 
So you could get um, plant blue or yellow flowers. Uh, you could build a simple bee house, like the picture here. Um, use natural pesticides, or if you want to use a real pesticide, make sure you're using it as the directions say. Um, you could share your land for beekeepers to use. If you have a lot of property, you could maybe um, call your Cornell Cooperative Extension for your county and ask them to give you some beekeepers uh, that live near you and you could ask them if they want to put some of their hives on your land. And I read a really nice article um, about in Connecticut, they're, um, they're really promoting out there, don't mow your lawn, let it get like six inches tall. And you know, like they really are promoting um, not mowing their lawn so that the, you know, the bees can uh, pollinate, can, can pollinate. So you could mow your lawns less. I said to build, let it get three inches tall so that the bees can use the clover. And that's it. And this is my list of resources. Um, there's the book that was very easy reading with lots of pictures and easy to understand. And Cornell, of course, uh, has a, a, bee, uh, a bee lab. Your cooperative extensions, um, the Asian Hornet, you can check with the Washington State Department of Ag because the Hornets showed up in Washington State. And I, I used a lot of information from the U.S. Department of Ag um, and the New York State Department of Ag. So that's it. Does, did I do good? Yeah. I got five minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Great. Thank you, Shar. That was really great. There was a lot of really great information in there. It was packed with info. Um, does anybody have any questions for Shar? You can either type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and um, and ask her. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a, a I've, I've really read a whole lot of stuff. So, I mean, if you ask me, I could probably answer it because I've really read a lot of things. I mean, other than like reproduction, like how the queens do all that, but mm -hmm. I could probably answer it. Yeah, hi, Charlene, this is Guy. I had a question about the bee pollen. Um, the pollen comes from from uh, the the plant, but is, it, is the bee pollen something different that comes from the, the bee itself? Is it the two types of pollen? I was a little bit confused about that. Yeah, um, no, the, the pollen only comes from the anther, which is the male organ. Um, is there any way I can go back up? Right. It just why do yeah. they call it bee pollen? I guess is what I'm saying because it's not. It doesn't really come from the bee. The po the pollen, right? All right. Uh, let me think a minute. Um. Okay. Um. I know the answer. They uh, they put the pollen in some of the cells because because they use it to eat. I mean that's a source of protein for them. So. Uh, these people go in and extract the pollen out of the, out of the hot honeycomb, just like the propolis in the royal jelly, folks. You know, the propolis is, is made by the honeybee and, yeah. um, and the royal jelly, and, and people extract that out, supposedly, and that's how they make those pills. But the pollen, they, they probably get the pollen, because you know how you can get those little pollen pellets, um, so I guess they, they extract it right from the honeycomb. Okay, so the, so the, so the, 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 the expression bee pollen is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not, it's not coming from the, it's not, it's not, a, it's oh, not no. an animal product that's being made no. by the bees. It's coming oh. from the plant. Correct. Okay. Coming out of the beehive. Yeah, they, they get it, the pile, oh, you know what? Guy, yeah, it comes out of the bee, my husband just said, it comes out of the bee honeycomb, so get what I mean? So that's why they call it bee pollen, because it's coming out of their honeycomb. But, but the pollen getting, comes from the plant. Yeah, the bees are obtaining the pollen from the plants. They're not making it themselves. Correct. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Trix um, typed a message in the chat box. She asks, are there concerns about honeybees being non-native? Concerns about um, Non-native, yeah. You know, can you hear me? Yep. 
Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so if you did, uh, this is an example. If you identify a honeybee, Western honeybee, um, and you put it up on iNaturalist, which I've done, and they put this explanation point, you know, that it's, you know, it's a non-native species. And so I was just wondering what, if there are some concerns, I know about, it's, they don't seem to be taking over, do they? I mean, I, I don't know, from other bees? Do you know if there are concerns about them being non-native? Um, hmm. I haven't read anything that says anything bad. It's just, you know, you, uh, that's a good question. I mean, um, well, I'll try to figure it out. I'm just, I was just curious. I'll Thank say you. that's a good question and I'm going to look into that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you want to know, does anybody say that the non-natives are, are not good or is that what? Well, know, there must, I just about? assume so because there must be some reason that. Well, oh yeah. Well, I mean, the honeybees are not native and they're, we use the heck out of them. I know we use the heck out of them. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, okay, thanks. I've looked on the site and there's a whole list of non native bees, but I'm not sure yeah. how to say, you know, anyhow. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Okay, um, Colette has a question How might someone find a hive in a woodlot? So if there's a hive out there somewhere, how could you find it? In a woodlot? Yeah, in your woods. I, there was an um, article out of a, um, another state magazine, uh, a lands, lands and forest magazine, and it was just about that, the hobby of going out in the wild and finding beehives. Um, but I don't know how to answer that one either. I, I could uh, I could actually, if you wanted to give me your email, I could email you the article. It's only two pages long, but um, you know, I wasn't looking specifically how to find them, but it probably mentioned that in the article. We had a a bee giant giant beehive descend on our house once uh, in the middle of. Lawrence, Kansas. It was huge, and we called the extension service, and they moved to it to uh, another place. But it was very interesting <laughs> how they just—it was just like immediate. They were all there. <laughs> nice. I'm writing these questions down because I want you know I do want to research them so that I can improve you know for the next next one the xerxes society has a lot of information on native pollinators as complementary uh to the non-native honeybees joyce joy yeah i would think that a beehive wouldn't be in the middle of the dense forest. It would be on the edges next to a field where there would be a diversity of flowers at different times of the year that they could uh, collect from. Um, and they wouldn't have to expend a lot of energy flying from the middle of the forest. So I would look around the edges of a woodlot. question but I don't want to turn on my microphone because it'll back feed. <laughs> you can type it in the chat box Bill. Uh, well I was curious, thinking of all these bees with the tractor trailers moving across the country pollinating all these fields and uh, imagine an accident. <laughs> he said that to me yesterday. <laughs> You know, you probably silly, but how would you collect them all? I mean, you gotta go find a new hive and don't that's a horrible thing to have happen. I, but does anybody know that how the bees how they collect their bees again after they've been 
pollinating? Does anybody know the answer? Yeah. I got to find that one out. Does anybody have bees there that's on? No. No beekeepers in the group? <laughs> great, great. I'm going to um, 